Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hymn 556 almost covers all the bases. I mean, that is a great and beautiful sermon in its right. And perhaps I was a bit foolish to have that as the hymn of the day because I don't know that I can live up to the message that this hymn proclaims. But if we look back to stanza 9, that's where we find ourselves now. Approaching that time when Jesus will ascend to heaven, when he will leave this earthly place in his bodily form and ascend into heaven to fill all places so that he is no longer present in this one place but present in all things in all places and present especially for us here in his church his bride his body where he gives us his righteousness in the waters of holy baptism and gives us his true body and most precious blood in the sacrament of the altar. Jesus starts his word to the disciples this day with words of comfort. And I think that's because he knows us. He knows us very well that we would not be listening when the bad news came. I think to myself at those times in my life when I've heard something I dreaded, when I was told something I didn't want to hear, when I was faced with a reality that I never would have chosen. For some children, it's, it's when mom and dad set them down and say, your mother and I are getting a divorce. Or when the doctor comes in and says, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we could do. When we hear this news, it strikes us. Our eyes gloss over. Our ears hear only sound but not words. Our whole focus is cast down. We aren't listening to what anyone says. That news strikes us so deeply, so hard, that it's as if time stops. I don't want to go on. I can't go on. Nothing exists. And that is how the disciples felt when Jesus told them, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. I'm leaving. I'm going away. And that's why before he gives this news, this news that will shock them, cast them down, he gives them that word. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. But what is the first word that he says? The first word he speaks to the disciples in our reading this day. If we actually hear these words and think about them, it's rather frightening. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Because if we honestly look at ourselves, we, like St. Paul, find, find that in our flesh dwells no good thing looking back on our lives or even in recent days or recent minutes, we see that we have sinned in a thousand different ways. We fail to trust God and His promises. We despair. We're greedy. We're envious. 
We call down God's wrath on the people who've hurt us or offended us. We don't care for our neighbor. We can't control our tongues. We slander. We devour others with our words. Even putting the best construction on our own motives, we yet put the worst construction on others. We believe and yet we don't believe. We know that faith without works is dead, and yet we know that our works are not enough. Faith apart from love is really unbelief. As Jesus now says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But what comes to those who disobey? Wrath and judgment are heaped upon those who disobey God's law. Is the first reading. As we hear from from Joel, where he says, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. If we really look at those words, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. There's not much comfort, only the death that we know we deserve. But Jesus goes on with other words. And he says, I will ask the Father. Perhaps a better translation, actually, with that word is, I will pray to the Father. And he will give you another helper, another comforter, to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, called the Comforter. And Dr. Luther had, well, perhaps even better words than the hymn he wrote today. The word comforter, he says, is a personal word. It's implying that the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. By saying that the Father will send you another comforter, Christ indicates that the Holy Spirit is a person distinct and separate from the Father and the Son. For the Son has been their comforter now. But when he goes away, he sends another comforter. Now later on, we do learn that the Holy Spirit is also God and of one essence with the Father and the Son. But for now, it is enough to learn and to note that he is is a comforter. A comforter for our sake. And so far as his deity is concerned, he is indivisible. Of the indivisible divine essence with the Father and the Son. But for us, for us, Christ calls him the Comforter. And this name is nothing else than a revelation, a realization of what we are to think of the Holy Spirit. Namely, that he comforts, he consoles. He's not another Moses. He's not a lawgiver who frightens with the devil, with death or with hell. He is the one who fills the saddened heart, fills it with laughter and joy toward God. He bids us to be of good cheer because of the forgiveness of your sins. He slays death. He opens heaven and he makes God smile on us. Now, if we could understand this definition, well, then we would already win that battle and we would have the sheer comfort and joy in heaven and on earth. And since the Father sends this comforter and Christ asks him, Christ prays him to do so, he will surely not send the comforter out of anger. It must flow from his fatherly goodness and mercy. And so as Christians, we should learn diligently to make good use of this title, this name that the Holy Spirit gives for himself and should note and remember that he is a comforter. When we are downcast, when we are the weak ones, it is he who comforts. In fact, he is the comforter of all the weak 
not only for us, but for all the world. And thus he says that he is the comforter, the comforter who will abide in Christendom forever. For in the world, nothing but hatred, persecution, temptation, and all sorts of adversity continue here. And a Christian must finally become weary and dejected under such tremendous weight, such persistent onslaught. I myself have often experienced this when the devil, through, through the work of the world and even my own conscience, he puts me to the test so severely that I know not where to turn. And since the devil does not cease or desist from his frightening, from wearying us in thoughts of sin and death, well, so also the Holy Spirit will never stop, will never weary of fortifying our hearts against this and inspiring us with courage to overcome it and cause us to say, as David spoke in Psalm 118, I shall not die, but I shall live, even though I feel a thousand deaths. I will still stand justified and holy before God, even though I felt burdened with the sin of the world. I will still be saved and go to heaven, even if you opened your hellish jaws much wider. My Lord Christ is not my enemy, Neither is the Father or the Holy Spirit, for they all cooperate in affording me the comfort which the Father sends, which the Son prays for, and which the Holy Spirit himself brings. So with glad hearts, confident in our Lord's kindness and grace in sending us such a comforter, we strive, therefore, we strive to be led by that same Holy Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, keeping the commandments, not for fear of punishment, but out of sheer delight at God's word and God's will. And we also know, and we also take heart, that the Holy Spirit will keep his holy church united in the one true faith, that we and all believers in Christ shall be raised on that day, glorified with Christ at the resurrection of all flesh, and to live and to serve and to delight in his kingdom, which has no end. But for now we rest in the Comforter, and we receive with glad hearts the true body and most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, a foretaste of that eternal and heavenly feast to which all who have gone before us in faith now enjoy. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.